Welcome to A Look Ahead. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's a marvelous thing to do, in, in my opinion. This particular series is about unity. It's entitled Oneness in Christ. It's the series for October, November, and December of 2018. And this is lesson number four in that series for October 27 of 2018, entitled The Key to Unity. Wow, we ought to know about that, shouldn't we? Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we certainly need to know about the key to unity. So help us to comprehend what we study here today, to read the words and to imbibe them and to make them a part of our lives is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So in this lesson, we will discuss the fact that through the life and death of Jesus, God plans, when everything has been finally concluded, to bring total harmony back to the entire universe. When will that happen? Well, or is yeah, it going to happen? At the third coming, really. After the third coming. At, at the end of the third coming. Just after the events of the third coming, right? Incredible as it may seem, Paul told us in three critical passages that this harmony will be restored at least partly by means of the church, Ephesians 3.10. But of course, it is the life and death of Jesus which is the key to all of it. And let's see if we can see documentation of that, proof of that. Carrie? I'll start with Ephesians 1, verses 9 to 10. <clears throat> In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Christ as head. Next we have Ephesians 3, verses 9 to 10. And of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. Next we go to Colossians 1, 19 to 20. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to Himself. God made peace through His Son's blood on the cross and so brought back to Himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. And that all comes from the Good News Bible translation. Wow. Wow, wow. <clears throat> In what way could we possibly teach the angels anything about God's wisdom? We spoke about that last week, but I think we need to talk about it again. This is an important point. The love of God and how he deals with people who are rebellious. Against. This world is the only place, the only time in which the angels of the universe will have ne find it necessary to observe God dealing with sinners. When we're done with this mess, sin and sinners will be gone, right? Well, I think that it's um, very incredible that God knocked at my heart. Mm -hmm. And I open the door and he comes in and he sups with me. Mm -hmm. So he's here within me. Mm -hmm. Those angels, I don't know if they can understand that. And they have never been desperate. They have never been against God. Mm -hmm. I was born against God mm -hmm. and been drawn to him. And that is such a, that's a powerful experience to go through. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. So God intends through this whole process to bring the whole universe back to himself. Now, what would he mean by bringing the whole universe back to himself? I think there's any problems anywhere out there or just the, the problems are just here. I think by the time it's all over, the other worlds will have a full 
view of what and why it was done the way God has done it. For those of you who would like to explore that point, read the chapter entitled It Is Finished in the Desire of Ages by Ellen White, if you have it available. Absolutely incredible chapter on that subject. So sin didn't arise here in the no. Garden of Eden. It arose in heaven next to God's throne in the heart of Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And so they had to be brought back too. Mm -hmm. Not Lucifer, he rejected that, but... Even, uh, you mean, even if, even the ones who didn't sin might have still had some questions? Absolutely. And those, God cannot deal with having anybody have any doubts about his goodness, his fairness, his equality, his transparency. So he's going to go through this incredible experience so that when he's done, nobody will have any doubts about him in any way. Now that process is education. Yeah, what? Which what, is redemption, using Ellen White's quote. There. Talking about education, how could anything be better than that? Well, does this have anything to do with unity, peace, and harmony? <laughs> it has everything to do with unity, peace, and harmony, doesn't it? That's at one moment. Yeah. The books of Ephesians and Colossians were written near the end of Paul's first imprisonment in Rome. Remember the first time he went to Rome? There were no charges against him immediately brought, and the, the government there sort of said, well, what are you doing here? And so they allowed him to rent a home. He was under sort of house arrest. He had Roman guards that stood by him, but, but he, that went on for about two years. He had already received hints that he might soon be released, and he was ri writing to groups that he might have an opportunity to visit. Ephesus was one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire, of that time, probably the fourth largest city, following Rome, the largest, Alexander in, Alexandria in Egypt, the second largest, Antioch in Syria, the third largest, and Ro uh, if Ephesus rivaled Corinth and Achaia for that position of, as the fourth largest. It was a great commercial center and had peoples from all over the world living there. It was a center of worship for, to Aphrodite or Diana, was a very um, sexually explicit, very uh, earthly kind of worship. It was Paul's plan under the direction of God to bring harmony in the midst of such a diverse membership pulled from all parts of Ephesian society. Try to imagine that. And it's a little like going to Los Angeles now and you've got people from all over the world living there and you've got Hollywood and you've got and say, okay, we're going to take a few from here and a few from there and a few from here and we're going to put them together and we're going to make them be, love each other and live together in perfect harmony, right? <laughs> Jim, don't look like that. Well, we know later that fortunately Ephesus became a kind of distribution center for Christianity. They would hand copy documents, gospels and letters and other things like that, and then they would send them out to other churches. And why do you suppose Ephesus would be the distribution center for the Christian church? There might be a couple of reasons that I can think of, but what would you think? Why would you think Ephesus would be a distribution center? It was in the, in the virtual crossroads. It was in a place where there was a lot of commerce coming and going, so that was part of it. Certainly, it would be easy. It was a port not far away at that yeah, point. He was, yeah. It was, actually, it was a, the, right the, on. the a river came right up to the... Yeah. It was a port at that point. You know, it's filled in with silt and whatnot from the river now, so it's back away from the, from the uh, ocean. Can you think of another reason? Well, what I think of, and this is a little bit strange in some people's thinking, but I, I, you know, I've been to Ephesus a couple of times, and I, I sort of graph what it's like. It's easier to carry on something that's uh, like this when you're spreading an illegal religion, when there's a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of different things, speaking different languages, whatever. It's not not so difficult to say, okay, we're doing something here. We're doing our own little, oh, just like a whole lot of other people around here. Uh, easier to hide mm -hmm. something. Yeah, yeah. I I visited uh, Berlin just a little while before the wall came down, 
and happened to have the opportunity to uh, travel around with a person who was responsible for a portion of the military, and that also, of course, was a portion of the spy apparatus that America was carrying on at that point in time. And he, he told us exactly how they would operate out of Berlin. He says, Berlin is a perfect place for spies, to train spies, because there's all sorts of stuff going on in Every country is trying to sort of figure out this and that, and so that would be an example, maybe a little bit like Ephesus in a, in a different sort of a way. Well, Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14, we already read a portion of that. Uh, in these verses, Paul expressed the idea that every spiritual blessing can be ours through Jesus Christ. He has adopted us, making us heirs of God. He has also chosen us to be saved. Now, some read that chosen us to be saved passage to suggest that God has predestined everyone, some to be saved and some to be lost. Is that true? No. No. He's called us all. He's requested all of us to come. It's just that only some of us accept his free offer so of John, salvation. Okay. John 3.16 says, well, God so loved 20% of the world, right? No. no. <laughs> God so loved... Predestined everyone to be yeah. saved. Yeah. It, it was God... that all be saved and brought to repentance, as Peter says. Okay. Here's the but challenge. Not only Peter... Where does someone say that very specifically? Do you know the, the, know the verse? The last, about the last one-third of, of Romans 8. He just says that in so many words. He predestined everybody. Well, what did he predestine them for? He wants everyone to be saved. That's what it says right there. Well, we see in Revelation as it all plays out that there are those who, who do not respond. Yeah. He knows that not everyone will accept this free gift of salvation. Uh, we've already mentioned John 3.16, and there's other places, 1 Timothy 2.6 and 2 Peter 3 that you mentioned that, you know, the gospel is out there. It's, it's free to everybody. While God has offered salvation to everyone, not everyone will respond positively. Jackie, I think you know have something about that. In the council of heaven, provision was made that men Though transgressors should not perish in their disobedience, but through faith in Christ as their <coughs> substitute and surety, might become the elect of God, predestined. Destinated. Yeah, that's hard to get off the tongue. Yeah. Predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. God wills that all men should be saved. Women too. Yes. <laughs> For ample provision has been made in giving his only begotten son to pay man's ransom. Those who perish will perish because they refuse to be adopted as children of God through Christ Jesus. Signs of the Times, Ellen White, January 2, 1893. She was in the middle of working some very challenging ideas about that time. Well, in previous lessons, we have discussed the fact that race, language, even religion, but especially culture, causes difference, cause differences of, of opinion. Often these differences lead to assorted barriers that keep people separated. And so, we read in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, uh, or we, we, we would suggest that you read that. In this passage, Paul was referring to the temple in Jerusalem. And Dennis, I think you have something on that. Yes. The ancient temple in Jerusalem had a wall of separation to distinguish the sections of the temple accessible only to ethnic Jews. This wall had an inscription that forbade foreigners to go any further under pain, pain of death. It is this regulation that Paul was accused of transgressing when he entered the temple after his missionary journeys. When Paul was arrested, he was charged with bringing into the Jewish section of the temple an Ephesian named uh, Trophimus, Acts 21-29. In this epistle, Paul argues that Christ is our peace, who has made both ethnic groups one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, so Ephesians 2-14. This is in the Adult Sabbath School Study Guide for Monday. 
October 22. And I'm going to try a little experiment here. Can you see what I'm looking at there? I guess this is a model of the temple, a uh, uh, model that's currently visible of the temple as best they've been able to reconstruct it, the temple that was there in the days of Jesus. And if you look very, very carefully, can you see my cursor there? Right on the edge of this central section of the temple, there's a low wall all the way around, if you can see it down there. And in that low wall, all the way around, there was this sign. Now, the sign in Greek is the actual stone is behind there, and I'm going to show you the original stone in a moment later, but it said in, in Greek, and in Roman, and in Latin, it said, foreigners must not enter inside the balustrade or into the forecourt around the sanctuary. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. So that was that thing that Paul was talking about, all around the, the inside temple. So you could come in the outer court, and that remember, that was supposed to be the place where Gentiles would come and observe the Jews worshiping and would be attracted to Jewish religion. But what had they turned it into? The riding wall. Stock it. A, Stock a racket. Stock exchange. <laughs> Stock exchange. You, you could come and buy your sheep and your whatever, lambs, whatever, to sacrifice. Well. So is this, it says foreigners. So is that even if they were converted to Judaism? Well, if, if they were fully converted to Judaism, was being circumcised yes. and all the rest of that, then they would not be qualifying as foreigners anymore. They would not be? No. Okay. Now, you. It's difficult to see this. I don't know how well you can see it on your TVs at home, but here is an actual stone with that message. It's been it's been beaten up some in some spots, but actual message in in this place. It's written in Greek uh, that was in that a wall. This is one of those stones that was actually there, um, warning Gentiles, and. It, we know that it was in a number of places around that wall because here's, now that one that I just showed you there is in the um, Archaeological Museum in Istanbul because the people who first found it were uh, under the Ottoman Empire in those days. And, but here's one in the old city of Jerusalem near the Lion's Gate. This six-line six fragment of the temple warning was found by Jates and so forth and so forth. But there's only part of it, but this is a, like a central section out of another one of those same, that, that same warning. So, and so you see now here, this part, I don't know if you can read this, but this area out here, the outside court here, was the court of Gentiles. And then in this, this four, the four section here was the court of women. And then here's the temple building here completely. And this, this balustrade or fence with the inscriptions is this, wall that's all around the outside. So, thought you might enjoy seeing that. Okay, do we, oh, look at that, came back for us. Okay, so what kind of differences still remain in our church today based on cultural beliefs and traditions? How can these differences be overcome? Gordon, I think you have something on that. Ephesians 4, starting with verse 1, I urge you then, I, who am a prisoner because I serve the Lord, live a life that measures up to the standard God set when he called you. Be always humble, gentle, and patient. Show your love by being tolerant with one another. Do your best to preserve the unity which the Spirit gives by means of the peace that binds you together. Wow. So Paul says what? Live a life that measures up to the standard God set when he called you. Be always humble, gentle, and patient. Show your love by being tolerant toward one another. I, who am prisoner because I serve the Lord, live a life that measures up to the standard God set when he called you. Would you dare to set yourself up as a standard? Do you remember what he says in Corinthians? 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Wow, humble, gentle, patient. Of course, that's what all Christians are, right? We try to be. Okay, good. If we walk after the Spirit. There you go. 
Paul recognized the problems that were brought about by differences in language, race, and especially culture. So he urged us at least to be tolerant of these differences. That was his first, that's the first step. First of all, you get tolerant of others who have different ideas and different beliefs. Uh, but ultimately, the goal is to go beyond tolerance, to recognize each person for his worth as a child of God, and recognize his or her spiritual gifts, which will be of benefit to the church as a whole. So he goes on, Gordon. Continuing in Ephesians 4, verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as there is one hope to which God has called you. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one God and Father of all, who is Lord of all, works through all, and is in all. Well, notice these seven different elements mentioned in these verses, which unite believers. How many of those elements are clearly demonstrated in your life and in your church? I'm not going to ask. Well, I'll ask you out there, since you don't have to respond to me. <laughs> How well are you doing on those seven? Well, Ellen White has some things to say about that, Jim. The Apostle exhorts his brethren to manifest in their lives the power of the truth which he had presented to them. By meekness and gentleness, forbearance and love, they were to exemplify the character of Christ and the blessings of his salvation. There is but one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith. All members of the body of Christ, all believers, are animated by the same spirit and the same hope. Divisions in the church dishonor the religion of Christ before the world and give occasion to the enemies of truth to justify their course. Paul's instructions were not written alone for the church in his day. God designed that they should be sent down to us. That, excuse me, what are we doing to preserve unity in the bonds of peace? Ellen White, Testimonies of the Church, Volume 5, 239. Anybody have an idea when Volume 5 was written? Shortly after the 1888 General Conference, uh, plus or minus a little bit. Everyone yeah. was pretty much in unity there, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> or the Almost opposite the of opposite. unity? <laughs> the opposite of unity. Well, pa Paul went on in his outline of what can be accomplished through the influence of the life and death of Jesus on church members. I mean, Paul actually felt that even though I, he said at one point, you know, I am the least of all the apostles, but at the same time, Follow me, follow my example as I followed the example of Christ. Wow. It is not only God's goal to get us to come together and tolerate each other, but also God has given us special gifts which are supposed to be used for the general benefit of the entire group. What do we know about those? Ephesians 4.11 It was he who gave gifts he appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. Now, we use other words for some of those categories today. What's another word for apostle? Missionary. Missionary. That's the Latin. Apostle is Greek. Missionary is Latin. Some are to be prophets. What's another word for a prophet? Well, you could say preachers. Okay, preachers, pastors, preach. and of course evangelists, we know what those are. Pastors and teachers, we know what those are. Paul recognized that things are not always going to be easy for Christians. Remember that the Christian church was still illegal in the Roman Empire, and the time was coming when to be identified as a Christian meant being sentenced to death. Okay? Um... Carrie, I think we got, are you on next? No, I'm there. Okay, Ephesians 4? You got me, yes. Okay. <clears throat> it's Ephesians 4, 12 to 16. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God we shall become mature people reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. 
Then we shall no longer be children carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by the tricks they invent. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ who is the head. And his control, all parts of the body, the different parts of the body, sorry, fit together and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. And that comes again from the Good News Bible. Wow. I thought we were supposed to be like little children. That's What's with this growing up business? Well, we be, we start as little children, but yeah. we don't want to okay. stay. So you mean children. we're not supposed to stay little children? Right. Okay. What's the most important characteristics of a small child? Teachability, I suppose. The capacity to grow. The capacity to grow in every way, mentally, physically, spiritually, socially. And if, if, if a child fails in growing any one of those four ways, it's a very sad thing. I just this afternoon saw a patient who was 35 years old acting like a five-year-old. It's sad. Mom is basically spending her whole life taking care of this, takes him into the shower, and maybe not even a five-year-old, he might even be less than that, takes him to bathe him, has to almost take care of him all the time. But God says, grow up. He urges us not only to tolerate each other, but also to grow up as, as, as children, becoming more and more loving, producing a cooperation that will be a benefit to the entire group. So the gifts we were given, how many of us have been a, given gifts by God? All of us. All of us. How, what are, who are we supposed to benefit with the use, with, uh, use of those gifts? Other Say it again. All of us. All the saints. We're supposed to be. We're supposed to be using our gifts to share to the whole world. Mm-hmm. I don't get out much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're not to be blown about by different notions brought in by people trying to lead others astray, but rather by speaking the truth in the spirit of love to grow up into Christ. You know, you know the passages in Matthew five. I mean, sorry, Matthew twenty-eight, nineteen, and twenty. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. Now, who's he talking to there? Immediate disciples. All, 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 the, all. all the pastors, right? Yeah. Well, it was immediately to the disciples yes. who we could say were Jesus' children. Mm -hmm. and then to the people under him who we could say were Jesus' grandchildren. Okay, and? And all of us. I heard someone preach a sermon one time titled, God Has No Grandchildren. What do you think was the point of that sermon? That we're all his children. We all need to be like his children. Yeah, exactly. Well, but, but we don't all have direct physical contact with Jesus. You don't have to have physical contact with Jesus. But there was a difference. Yes, there was, exactly. So what are we, God intends for every one of us to use our gifts and to use those gifts to carry the gospel to the world. That's the point. If every Seventh-day Adventist were doing what you are doing, how quickly would the gospel be finished? Has Ephesians 4.13 been fulfilled in your life and in your church? Unfortunately, particularly in Western society, particularly Western society, I'm sorry, has been infected with the idea that as individuals, we are supposed to act independently and not to not be accountable to anyone else. But Paul reminded us that the greatest joy and peace comes when we live together in love and harmony, following the example of Jesus Christ. So what spiritual gift or gifts do you have? How are you using them to benefit your local church and perhaps even the Seventh-day Adventist church as a whole? 
Isn't that what these verses are saying? Sounds like it to me. Christianity. What does Christianity mean? What does the term mean? Well, why do you follow Christ, I guess? Following the example of Jesus Christ, sure. It's all about relationships. God is love. <clears throat> love can never happen within one individual. So is God happy with just being himself or maybe even just the three of them? No. He wants to have more people to love. And is more that people who are capable of loving each mm -hmm. other. Yeah. So does God intend for us to have that kind of love? Yes. He does. We need to relate to God through Jesus and to others around us, especially in the church. Ephesians 5. <coughs> I guess we're ready for Jackie. Mm. So, be careful how you live. Don't live like ignorant people, but like wise people. Make good use of every opportunity that you have, because these are evil days. Don't be fools then, but try to find out what the Lord wants you to do. Do not get drunk with wine, which will only ruin you and your family. Hmm. Doesn't say that, but. Yeah. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with the words of psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing hymns and psalms to the Lord with praise in your hearts. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, always give thanks for everything to God the Father. And then, wives and husbands, submit yourselves to one another because of your reverence for Christ. Amen. Good news, Bible. You said something interesting up there about do not get drunk with wine, which will only ruin you. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Um, is there another word commonly used for wine and strong drink spirits spirits so <laughs> how do you think it got that name well, they're unseen well sort of unseen forces that can, that uh, affect your behavior yes both from what i've seen alcohol seems to give license for poor behavior it just it just happens yeah, Seems it fills good. people with, they would tell you, it fills people with love and joy and, There's of course, everybody. That, that it makes them just mean. Mm -hmm. yes. it on it's called lack of inhibition, lack of yes. frontal uh, restraint. The frontal lobe, frontal lobe is restraint. put to sleep. Yeah. So it's odd to call something uh, an adult beverage when, in fact, it makes you act more juvenile. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Notice that Paul recognized that submission to others within the church community comes about because we are filled with the Spirit, capital S, not the spirits that come out of a bottle, but rather the Holy Spirit that comes down from God. Harmony throughout the universe will be possible only when everyone is willing to be humble and thoughtful of others. Well, he goes on in Ephesians 5:22 to six nine it's quite a lengthy section we might have time to read a little bit of that let me let me just turn there wives submit to your husbands as to the lord for husband has authority over his wife just as christ has authority over the church and christ is himself the savior of the church's body and so wives must submit completely to their husband just as the church submits itself to christ and you jackie should we stop there Absolutely not. No. <laughs> husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Now, if every husband did that, there would be no problem from the wife's point of view, would there? He did this to dedicate the church to God by his word, after making it clean by washing it in water, in order to present the church to himself in all its beauty, pure and faultless, without spot or wrinkle or any other perfection. Imperfection, I'm sorry. Um... So what is that church going to eventually be called in the end of book, the book of Revelation? The, 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 br uh, the bride. bride of Christ, yeah. It's going to be, he's, going to pre he's preparing this church because it's going to be his bride. 
Men ought to love their wives just as they love their own bodies. A man who loves his wife loves himself. People never hate their own bodies. Instead, they feed them and take care of them, just as Christ does at church, for we are members of his body. As the scripture says, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and unite with his wife, and the two will become one. There is a deep secret truth revealed in this scripture, which I understand is applying to Christ and the church. But it also applies to you. Every husband must love his wife as, he, as himself, and every wife must respect her husband. And he goes on and talks about the role of children with their parents and the role of slaves with their masters. And I won't, I'm not going to take time to read all that. If each of these relationships were infused with the love of Christ, what an incredible difference it would make in our church communities and in the world. And I think you have something on that, Dennis. Yes, this is uh, Ellen White from Testimonies of the Church, Volume 9, uh, page 189.4, 90.4 to uh, 191.1. If we would humble ourselves before God and be kind and courteous and tenderhearted and pitiful, there would be 100 conversations to conversions uh, yeah, to the church where there, now there is only one. But though professing to be converted, we carry about with us a bundle of self that we regard as altogether too precious to be given up. <laughs> wow. It is our privilege to lay this burden at the feet of Jesus, at the feet of Christ, and in its place take the character and similitude of Christ. The Savior is waiting for us to do this. Christ recognized no, no distinction of nationality or rank or creed. The scribes and Pharisees desired to make a local and a national benefit of all the gifts of heaven and to exclude the rest of God's family in the world. But Christ came to break down every wall of partition. He came to show that his gift of mercy and love is as unconfined as the air, the light, or the showers of rain that refresh the earth. The life of Christ established a religion in which there is no caste, a religion by which Jew and Gentile, free and bond, are linked in a common brotherhood, equal before God. No question of policy influenced his movements. He made no difference between uh, neighbors and strangers, friends and enemies. That which appealed to his heart was a soul thirsting for the waters of life. Wow. As two slightly separated passages from uh, Volume 9 of the Testimony by Ellen White, but is it really possible that if we did what we were supposed to, there would be a hundred conversions to the truth where now there's only one? Incredible. Well, I, I, I suspect that if we were a lot more like Christ, that would happen. Can you imagine the effect of that over time? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's you know, it's more than exponential growth. Mm -hmm. Well, even if we had exponential growth, how long would it take, to fit for it take us to finish the gospel? Well, these powerful words point out how important it is that we lay aside our selfishness and our egocentricity and instead practice the, uh, practice the humility and submission demonstrated by Jesus. How can we do that? And stopping for a second, what thing, what thing or things can you think of in the life of Christ that demonstrated his humility? We certainly speak of the ordinance of humility at, yes. in the upper room as he washed the feet of the, the dusty feet yes. of the 11, well, 12 disciples at the time. Yeah. Here's the God of heaven kneeling down. And Jesus could have looked up at their face and said, you know what? The Father would do just what I'm doing right now. To be born as a baby. Yeah. Well, the Ephesians uh, 2, where it speaks of uh, his condescension to mm -hmm. become a man and, uh, yeah. and a bondservant and to the point of death, etc. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
Is it clear in our minds that why the life and death of Jesus makes it possible for to live together in harmony? Do we I mean, what? Okay, he died, and I, I'm glad. And many people would say, okay, that's just the, the ticket buys me a ticket for the kingdom. Does that make me humble and want to live with others in harmony, or I'm just happy I got the ticket? Or is that why Jesus died? Well, the, he becomes a focal point. He said, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all to me. And so, and you see that everywhere, even secularly, people wear, wear crosses just because it's the fashion, you know, or something. But mm. it's hard to get away from that, that, uh, that event, that okay. important event. Well, what has Christ done for us? Is there more to the cross than just buying a ticket for us? Well, it's in Romans 5.10, Paul says that we are saved by his life or we are healed by his life. So he, I recommend uh, studying his, his life and his actions throughout the life and find out what he was here for. Well, the life of Christ, let's just talk about some things that are just perfectly clear from Scripture. One, it demonstrated convincingly that sin leads to death. We're not talking about the physical death, heart attacks, or strokes, and that kind of stuff. It leads to the second death, that the devil is light, and that the second death is defined in, in the book of Revelation, that the devil has lied to us, and that God's way is the only safe way to live. That's pretty clear. Uh, I mean, uh, the life of Jesus sort of gives us a choice. So, two. So, that was the, our, that was the discussion in the garden. Mm -hmm. The devil said, God has lied. God said, sin leads to death. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, by his life and his death, Christ demonstrated the truth about God's character and government. That's a pretty important point, right? Three, Jesus demonstrated that God is forgiveness personified. How do we say, how do we, how do we demonstrate that? I, I, I'm trying to imagine Jesus is, is stretched out there on, on the cross. They are pounding nails to his hands. And what is he saying? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Could he, could he say, Father, forgive them if he hadn't forgiven them himself? No. And, but when he was still alive, he it was talking to the disciples. The disciples, how many times should we forgive? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Jesus says, always be forgiven. The, par the, uh, the It was hyperbole. He says, 70 times 7. Uh, well, the, one of the disciples said, 7 times? No, 70 times 7. What he's really saying is, always be forgiving. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants to take something from you, give it, or take your coat, give him, give him your cloak also, or he slaps you on one side of the cheek, let him slap you on the other one. Wow. That, that, that's an antithesis of other ways of uh, functioning in, in life. Well, number four, he demonstrated... One other thing there. Yeah. Is forgiveness what we, what we really need? We need healing. Yeah, we, we need, need healing, change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the point we're trying to make, I think, is God is... Forgiveness is for everybody. Everybody is forgiven. The problem is not everybody's willing to be healed. Yeah. And healing is an education process. Mm -hmm. Salvation, sojo, so on and so forth. Sojo, yeah, means salvation. Salvation means healing. Yeah. But we can resist to that. Oh, resist yeah. that by not forgiving others, as Jesus said. Sure. If you don't yeah. forgive others, then God will not forgive you. Yeah. Well, it, he's, you're still forgiven. Well, you don't need to beg for forgiveness. No. It's, just, it's just the way God is. He's yeah. not that way part of the time. It's always forgiving. Yeah. The problem is he's willing to educate, and many people don't want to be educated. Well, number four on my list. He demonstrated what we must become if we are to be saved. His life showed us how to live. His life and his death give us a choice. We can choose to live a life like his, or we will die a death like his, separated from God. The ultimate tragedy. The life and death of Jesus Christ are not only for the purpose of providing salvation for sinful human beings, but also to give us direction and the ability to live Christ-like lives today. I mean, this should happen now. We need to learn how to maintain an ongoing connection with Christ on a daily basis. 
Christ has not only promised us every spiritual blessing, we read that, Ephesians 1, but also he promised adoption into the family of heaven, forgiveness, redemption, and healing, Jim, there we go, to all our relationships. What more could we ask? When discussing the problems that we face in our local church communities, we often focus on doctrine and different understandings of Christian beliefs. But unity in Jesus includes much more than just doctrinal unity. In fact, that is not his primary focus. God's plan is for us to follow the example of Jesus in our lives, which will, in turn, lead us into total harmony with our fellow Christians who are following the example of Jesus in their lives. So how well do you think two different individuals who are both following the example of Jesus would get along? Shouldn't be any problem, right? That's why all Christian marriages just turn out perfect. Why is everybody smiling? <laughs> One or the other of us uh, in a marriage might not be doing One exactly or the that. or the other or both of oh, us. Both? Okay. <laughs> both of us might have, have a problem with Oh, how sad. Well, well we would need to try to be uh, together on things if if one if we don't we, we be do acting. our sinning together or well or uh, operating unilaterally one goes this way or does stuff something in secret i mean there's good secrets to be kept in you know birthday parties and stuff like that but it, there are other ways that things are done mm -hmm. uh, where the two are not counseling well, each other we're supposed to be one aren't we right yeah well the great controversy did not begin on this earth gordon has been reminding us of that it started in heaven next to the throne of God when Lucifer, who was supposed to be the light bearer, that's what his name means, began to think rebellious thoughts. So God's plan must include a restoration of harmony throughout the universe. And harmony has to happen in heaven as well. Of course, we are now the main focus of the rebellion be against his kingdom. Why is that? We're all sinners, right? Through the life and death of Jesus, the universe has already been restored to harmony. They are just waiting for that harmony to be restored here on earth. Do you think the angels have ever questioned the wisdom of God's plan for making this earth his future headquarters? Sure they have. How yeah. could they not, seeing the mess that is here now? Ellen White in two or three different places says, has said several times that they watch things happen and when they, for example, at the book of Judges, they said, okay, God, just give us permission. We'll wipe out those sinners down there. And what does God do? No, oh, no, no, no. And other places, you know, why do you tolerate these characters? You know? Let's bring that flood back. Bring the flood back, yeah. Wow. So why would God want to make this earth his future headquarters? Isn't that a strange thing to do? Well, this is this was the the camp of the rebellious. This is the greatest victory, though. This is Maybe. where the great controversy was won. So I remember uh, going. Well, the first time I went to Dachau, a uh, concentr mm -hmm. Jewish concentration camp in Germany, South, southern Germany, yeah. And you know, I I was just appalled by all the displays there. And then often, one, off at one side, as you get all the way through the camp, it says, never again. Yep. And that's what this earth is going to be. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a memorial for what happened to sin. Yeah. I'm going to say, never again will this happen. Mm -hmm. Amen. And it's not through force. It's through, because God has educated them, demonstration. Uh, it, it's yeah. it's the only way it'll have. I was just reading here in Judges chapter three, no, ju yeah, Judges chapter three, that yeah. they might learn to know war. Yeah. Why? The war began in heaven. What is a war? Killing each other? No, it's a war of ideas through force. Mm -hmm. God, love means you can't force because you don't exercise your choice, which is.
freedom to choose is is love. Yeah. Through force. Yeah, I uh, last summer I had the privilege of visiting Poland, and we went down to Auschwitz and Birkenau, and it's the mm -hmm. same 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 story. You know, there's train lines come in there like this, and you go in there, and that's the end of the line. There were no full trains that came out. You so just I think about it is we've got more anti-Jew feeling around the world now than we've had in a long time. Yeah. I well, that never again didn't last for very really long, long, did it? Nope. Not even for the Jews, let alone for, for wars. Well, in Ephesians 4 through 6, that we've been sort of jumping around in, Paul describes the steps, the attitudes, and the actions which will be necessary to develop and maintain Christian unity. These attributes include humility, Ephesians 4.2, gentleness, Ephesians 4.2, patience, Ephesians 4.2, truthfulness, Ephesians 4.25, love, Ephesians 5.1, submission, Ephesians 5.22-23, and obedience, Ephesians 6. Are we ready for this? Well, in John 15, 1 through 17, he talks about the vine and the branches. He, he dealt with the question of disunity very clearly. He spoke about himself as a vine, which we must be connected if we're going to have life in Christ. Every member of the church is supposed to be a part of that flourishing vine. And Jim, I think, or was it Gordon? Do you have something on that? From Ellen White, Desire of Ages, while the graft is outwardly united with a the vine, there may be no vital connection. Then there will be no growth or fruitfulness. So there may be an apparent connection with Christ without a real union with him by faith. A profession of religion places men in the church, but the character and conduct show whether, they're, whether they are in connection with Christ. Desire of Ages 676. Lord, so, yes. Lord, Lord, we did all these things in your name, and he says, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. So this, that would be similar to this passage there. Since we have a moment or two here, let's just look at that I incredible passage. It's found in, in, in chapter 7 of Matthew. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter. Matthew seven twenty one and following. Not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. Now this is part of the Sermon on the Mount. This was something that happened fairly early in Christ's ministry. And I wonder how many of the people who heard that had any idea of the implications of it. When judgment day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in your name we spoke God's message. By your name we drove out many demons and performed many miracles. Then I will say to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. I want to ask you a question in that context. When Jesus, and let me just jump over a couple of chapters here. He's still in Matthew, Matthew chapter 10. Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority. This is, I'm reading from Matthew 10, starting from the first verse. Gave them authority. This was their first. He's just chosen them. He's just chosen them. Okay? Gave them authority to drive out evil spirits, to heal every disease and every sickness. And if you go down there, the mission of the 12, these 12 men were sent out by Jesus with the following instructions. Do not go to any Gentile territory or any Samaritan town. Instead, you're to go to the lost sheep of the people of Israel. Go and preach the kingdom of heaven is dear. Heal the sick. Bring the dead back to life. Heal those who suffer from dreaded skin diseases. And of course, that's in the King James is translated leprosy. And drive out demons. You think Judas ever brought anybody back to life? Well, he may have. It would be God that brought him back to life. But, yeah. But through his, his... Have you ever wondered... He sent them out two by two, didn't he? Have you ever wondered who the, who the companion of Judas Peter. was? But it wasn't Peter or John or James. <laughs> no, probably not. 
Yeah, I, I, I would. Could be the other one, and Judas sort of just hung back. Maybe I, I don't know. That's just speculation. He could have. He could have. You know, I don't know how many dead were raised. It does We don't have the accounts, but uh, they were buried pretty quickly. So coming upon somebody who was who is dead and would need to be raised uh, might be. Um, on the lower end of the probability of what they would do. The lower end of the probability, okay. <laughs> but all the disciples looked up to Judas. Mm -hmm. They were impressed by Judas. Yeah. Oh, he had the money bag. Yeah. I mean, can you... He was the educated, the, uh, the brilliant one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Smooth talker, probably, too. Yeah. Well, and, and now the white says he, he urged his own way into the group. And what did Jesus say to him? Birds have nests and foxes, foxes have their holes, but the Son of God has nowhere to lay his head. And what was he trying to do? Trying to discourage Judas from joining the, the group. Because Judas was looking for a palace. He was looking for a home in, in, in the high places of earth, right? Well, so we have to ask ourselves this ultimate question. Has Christ improved your life? Has Christ improved the relationships within your church? Has he removed the barriers that we, we looked at? Those, that low barrier, but what a difference it made around the, you know, here's the temple, the temple that is supposed to be the center place of worship for the whole world, and here's a barrier right around the edges of it. No foreigners allowed in here. What, what, and I have to tell you, unfortunately, there was a time when it was very difficult to put a, a Christian church in a Muslim territory. There was one Muslim country where there was an Adventist church with a sign over the roof, no Muslim admitted here. And the reason, of course, was that the government at that point in time said, if you convert a Muslim to Christianity, you're, you're dead. Well, we've read a lot about getting together, love and unity, and I hope that has given you something to think about. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to be your children. Help us to really be your children. The kind of loving, kind, tender, uh, gracious people, that, that the kind of people you lived, to be like you. As we continue in this series of lessons talking about unity, may we grow up into your likeness, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.